G'day, it's Jamie, and welcome to Where's My Yowie. Today, I'm running an old Aussie bush yarn from 1918, so we'll get into it. This was published in Adelaide's The Register on Tuesday, the 28th of May, 1918. Title, Platypus or Bunyip, Reminiscences from Green's Plains. Our Greens Plains correspondent writes, Two interesting articles which recently appeared in the Register dealing with the platypus and its prospective utility for museum purposes recall vivid recollections of a praiseworthy attempt made some years ago to capture that precious and provokingly elusive animal. At that time, the bunyip and platypus were very popular in the middle and lower north and other streams. More or less reliable witnesses had repeatedly seen the bunyip browsing on the banks of sundry deep water holes in the Broughton River, into which it always disappeared on sight with a mighty splash and a floating tail. The platypus, although not strongly in evidence, was known to be prowling around in search of what it, whatsoever it might devour. The merry mention of these weird creatures was wont to send a spinal quiver through the anatomy of all small boys in those days, and particularly at night. Yet, strange to say, it was juvenile enterprise that on one occasion very nearly affected the capture of one or both of these monsters, and it came about this way. The writer, with an oft-tried and trusty schoolmate named for short Monty, was by special arrangement at a moderately late hour one evening, sampling some grapes in a distant neighbour's garden. We had just filled our shirts to their utmost holding capacity when the good man of the vineyard came out with a shotgun and cheerfully, although maybe somewhat hastily, accompanied us for about half a mile up the road. The first lesson. Not thinking it expedient to bring an even kindly disposed neighbour home with us at that hour of night, we dodged through a thick hedge and headed off in the direction opposite to home and friends. And after having done a brilliant uphill spurt of about 200 yards, we came to a deserted old hut, wherein we decided to tarry a while and partake of some light refreshment. But just after we reached the open doorway, we heard a rustling sound within and something white materialised in the inner darkness. With a suppressed dull moan and a swivel-like turn, we faced about and were instantly retracing our steps at a pace that reduced by 50% all previous 15-year-old records. We saw the thick prickly hedge as we came in, but saw it not as we passed out. We flashed across the road regardless of the man and gun and flying shot. Dashed over or through fences, creeks and ditches, heedless of expense, and reached Monty's place in a most dilapidated and exhausting condition. With heaving flanks and panting breath, and with perspiration and grape juice oozing out through every pore in our clothes. Here we met Mr Smiley, a neighbour, just leaving for home, and by persuasion, bribes and threats, he soon got all the story and most of the grapes out of us. Now Smiley was great on bunyips and fauna and things, and he grasped the situation at once, and without the slightest hesitation, pronounced that we had either seen to be either a bunyip or a platypus which he proposed with our assistance to capture on the following night. Accordingly, at about the same hour next night, 
we were again in the vicinity of the old hut, where we met Smiley, who came along on horseback on his way home from the nearest town. After having tied his horse to the fence, he made a running noose in a piece of new rope, carefully adjusted a bottle he had in his pocket, and then boldly led the way through the fence. The second lesson. Smiley was a man of mature years and afraid of nothing, and as he strayed along, he whistled in a sort of undertone. And we felt proud of him and kept close up to him, as we did not know what might be in the darkness behind us. And Monty clutched my arm and showed me his father's old bush-ranging pistol, which he was carrying at full cock. Smiley stopped whistling and did not walk quite so fast as we neared the hut. When about 10 paces from it, he stopped short and called, Hello! and said hello again, but not quite so loud. Getting no reply, he picked up a stone and threw it through the open window or somewhere, and next moment an awful looking white object stood in the doorway. Its head seemed to be split right down the centre and opened out both ways as it gave a hoarse moan. With a whirling leap, Smiley spun around in mid-air and knocked us both down before we could do likewise. But in less than three seconds, we were up and after him, and although we had no stopwatch to go by, it is computed that we did the first 200 yards in 14 seconds. Under normal conditions, I could give Monty 10 yards in 100, crib 5 at the start, and then beat him easily by 7. But now I could not get near him. He seemed to be flattened right out along the ground and getting away from me at every stride. And old Smiley, we didn't know that he could run at all, but now he was doing three yards to our two. Once he tripped in the rope he was carrying, turned to Catherine Will, landed again on his feet and kept going without missing his stride or losing speed. They did not see the fence, nor did I, till I heard them falling over it. We missed the footbridge at the creek, but crossed the stream on top gear, with Smiley still leading on for home. We completed the two miles in about four minutes and three quarters. Smiley leaped his garden fence and disappeared into his house without stopping to open the door or saying good night. Monty, of course, could not be expected to go home alone at that hour of night, and so we decided, at full speed, that he should share my room with me. In the safe seclusion of which, he found that he had dropped his father's pistol at the hut in a hurried start of the homecoming. The following morning, being Sunday, we boldly returned for that small gun, and overtook Smiley, also on the way back. He had remembered that he had forgotten his horse and lost his bottle on the previous night. We found the horse still fastened to the fence and the inside of the closure grazed an old white donkey. The first, and at the time, the only real donkey imported into the district. This was what had been roosting in the heart but it might easily have been either a bunyip or a platypus. The end. I like that story. That's pretty cool. I like how the guy knocked the two kids over running away and left his horse there. That's classic. Okay, that's it for me. I'll get back to you all next time. Bye.